Our scripture this morning is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 and 3, and then 11 through 15. The Israelites have already followed Moses out of Egypt, out of this land of slavery, and they are out in the wilderness. They are definitely in a time in between. And you might say that the thrill is gone. They are frustrated, they are hungry, they are tired, and the complaining has begun. And they wonder if maybe they made a mistake leaving Egypt to begin with. The whole Israelite community complained against Moses and Aaron in the desert. The Israelites said to them, oh, how we wish that the Lord had just put us to death while we were still in the land of Egypt. There, we could sit by the pots cooking meat and eat our fill of bread. Instead, you've brought us out into this desert to starve this whole assembly to death. The Lord spoke to Moses. I've heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will have your fill of bread. Then you will know that, the, that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, a flock of quail flew down and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the desert surface were thin flakes, as thin as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? They didn't know what it was. Moses said to them, this is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. My great aunt Eleanor was a remarkable woman. She lived till the ripe old age of 102. She was married and widowed three times, and her third husband died when they were just in their 60s. She never had any children. She worked all her life. She was a beautician, and she had a little beauty shop attached to her house. My father was her only nephew, and they had developed a wonderful relationship when he was very young, when he would go spend summers with her. And the people in her little town in Nebraska who knew her knew that he was the emergency contact for her. She had one neighbor in particular who for years had made a habit of either calling Eleanor or checking in on her in person every single day to make sure that things were going okay. When Eleanor was 98 years old, her neighbor called my dad. And she said, this isn't an emergency. I don't want you to worry. She said, but I noticed the last couple months when I've been over to see your Aunt Eleanor, well, she just seems to have slowed down. <laughs> she said, I, I don't think she needs to be to the doctor. I don't think, she said, it's just that my Aunt Eleanor, my great Aunt Eleanor was an everything in its place kind of person and things were not in their place. And she said, I'm not sure if you know, but there is a new assisted living facility on the edge of town that is just lovely. She said, my mother moved in there recently, and it's been one of the greatest decisions we've made. She loves it there. So my dad appreciated the phone call, and he got a hold of his Aunt Eleanor and didn't let her know that her neighbor had called, but said that he and my mom would like to come visit. She thought that was wonderful. So that following weekend, they went to Nebraska to see her, and they had uh, made arrangements to get there right after lunch so she wouldn't have to make a meal. But the plan was actually for them to go to the assisted living facility in the morning before they got to Eleanor's just to see what it was all about, just to check it out. So they'd been in touch with the administrator there. And when they got there, she was expecting them. And she gave them a tour. She started out by showing them one of the model apartments with furniture in it. You could kind of see what would fit and what wouldn't. It had a nice living area, a nice sized bedroom, a kitchenette, and a very nice bathroom. And then they, on the way to the dining room, they went by a common room that was a big room with windows from floor to ceiling that had a big television in there. She said that in the evenings they would show a movie and many of the residents liked to, liked to come watch a movie together. There were tables out as well with cards, decks of cards and dominoes and jigsaw puzzles ongoing. And there were some people in there just having a conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then she took them to the dining room. It was important to her that my parents have a meal in the dining room with the residents because, she said, the food here is really good and it's a big selling point. So they went into the dining room and they sat down at a table, the three of them, and waiters brought over menus. They ordered off the menus, the food came, it was delicious. They were delighted. They had all their questions answered and then they went on to Aunt Eleanor's home. 
they got there early afternoon and she had them come in and they, they sat down in her living room and they started to converse and catch up and they were having a wonderful conversation. And after a while, the conversation lulled a little bit and my dad said, Eleanor, we noticed on the way into town there's a new assisted living facility on the edge of town not far from where you live. He said, are you aware of that? And she said, yes. And he said, well, have you ever had any reason to go there to visit anybody? Have you ever been in there? No. She said, David, you are not putting me in a nursing home. And he said, nobody's putting you anywhere. He said, but from what we understand, they have skilled nursing if anybody would ever need it, but it's an assisted living facility. We thought that maybe while we were here, the three of us could go and just take a look. No. She said, you are not putting me in a nursing home. I would rather be dead. And so they dropped the conversation. They let it go. And they went on to have a wonderful weekend. And they were glad to know that it was there. And it didn't appear as if she would need that anytime very soon. But then a couple months later, the phone rang. And it was her neighbor. And her neighbor told my dad, your aunt has had a pretty serious fall. And she's in the hospital. And you need to come. So my parents went. Talked to the doctor. As it turned out, she was just very dehydrated. She hadn't been eating well. She just hadn't been taking care of herself, and that's why she fainted. So they were going to keep her in the hospital, get her hydrated, get some food into her, get some of her strength back. But then the doctor said even when she's released, she's going to need, a, need to be an inpatient physical therapy for about six weeks. And my dad said, well, where does that take place? Here at the hospital? The doctor said, no. There's this really nice assisted living facility on the edge of town. And my parents thought, Perfect. This makes the doctor the bad guy, and she gets this six week to see what it's like, right? So they got a hold of the administrator and they, they let her know what they knew. And normally, if you're going to go someplace for just six weeks like that, you're in a room that's pretty spare. It's, you know, like a bed and a dresser. You don't stay in an apartment. So they asked the administrator while, while she's here for six weeks, could she please be in one of the apartments? Yes, they were able to do that. So my parents had a couple days to run back and forth from her house and bring some of her stuff so that it would seem familiar and it would be warm and comforting. And, um, you know, even they had a hospital bed in the bedroom, but they brought her, her blankets and her pillows and everything, some of her photos and all that. So the day came that she was <clears throat> released from the hospital, and they transported her over there because, of course, she was still using a wheelchair, and my parents followed. And they got to the assisted living facility and they rolled her into this foyer that was just beautiful. They rolled her in, the administrator was there, welcomed them, and Eleanor looked around. She said, what is this? And my dad was kind of surprised because her mind was really sharp and they'd been talking about this for a couple days. He said, well, this is where you're going to be doing physical therapy for the next six weeks. So the administrator said, let's take you to your apartment so you can see that, and then we'll come down to the dining room for a meal. So they took her to her apartment, and the administrator opened the door. They wheeled her in, and my folks knew she was just going to be thrilled. <laughs> they got her in there. She looked around, and she said, David, what is this? And he couldn't figure out what the problem was. And he said, well, this is where you're going to be living while you're here having your physical therapy for the next six weeks. So they dropped off her bags and some of her stuff, and they went on to the dining room. By way of the common room, they kind of stepped in there for a moment. She wanted nothing to do with that. And they went into the dining room, and they went to a table for four. So my parents and Eleanor and the administrator could sit together. A waiter brought over the uh, menus, put menus in their hands, and about that time the administrator got called away on a page. And when the three of them were sitting at the table, Aunt Eleanor said to my dad, David, what is this? He said, Eleanor, it's the dining room. He said, what do you mean, what is this? And she said, you said we were going to the nursing home. Do you see what happened? She'd never been in a place like this before. She had no idea what it was. Every time somebody said assisted living facility, she envisioned a nursing home, and apparently one that she had visited had not been very nice. And that's what she was expecting. She was expecting a nursing home. This was not a nursing home. And it really threw her off. Because what she expected to see was nothing like what was being presented. 
And in the midst of not understanding and not, and this all being so unfamiliar, she was unable to just receive what was beautiful and lovely that was put right in front of her. And you know something? We all do this. We all do this. When was the last time you had to move? Or when was the last time you chose to move? You know, whether we move because we want to or we move out of necessity, anytime we move, it's unsettling. And we don't have to restrict this to moving from one residence to another. We can think of it like this, moving from what has been to what will be. Anytime we go through moving from what has been to what will be, we end up in a time of transition that is very, very uncomfortable because practically nothing is familiar. And we really don't know what the future holds. We know what direction we're heading in, but until we arrive, we don't know. And there's great uncertainty in that. Whether it be moving from one residence to another, or a relationship, a primary relationship is changing, or your job is changing, or the school you're used to is changing, or the town you've lived in forever you're moving away from, or the church you love you have to go away. There is this uncertainty. There is this time in between, and it is significant, and it cannot be avoided. When we are moving from what has been to what will be, we can't do it like that. We can't. We end up in this time. And I'm not just talking about living out of boxes and eating off of paper plates. I'm talking about a time of real unknowing, where there can be a real sense of loneliness, a sense of confusion, due to the fact that everything that was familiar in that area of your life is just gone. And even if the familiar was less than ideal, at least we recognized it. In this transitional time, it is as if we cannot find home. Transitional time is foreign to us. What is this? And what we tend to do consciously or subconsciously is seek out comfort by seeking out what is familiar. We ache for what is familiar when we are in transitional time. And when we feel this way, we have a tendency to remember the past in inaccurate and false ways. We have a tendency to romanticize the past in a way that it probably doesn't deserve. All of this is happening in our scripture today. The Israelites have followed Moses out of Egypt and into the desert. And time has gone by, and they are hungry, and they are tired, and they are very, very frustrated. The Israelites said to them, Oh, how we wish that the Lord had just put us to death while we were still in the land of Egypt. There we could sit by the pots of cooking meat and eat our fill of bread. Instead, you brought us out into the desert to starve this whole assembly to death. See, in the midst of hunger... The present seems worse than the past, even when the past included terrible, oppressive slavery. They actually romanticized the past with memories of cooking meat and all the bread that they could eat. And of course, when you're hungry, this probably makes sense. The Lord spoke to Moses, I've heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will have your fill of bread, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God. And in the evening, a flock of quail flew down and covered the camp. And that is the meat. That is the meat. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the desert surface were thin flakes, as thin as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? And Moses said to them, this is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Well, this was not what they were looking for. This certainly didn't look like any bread that they were used to. It didn't look like bread at all. And yet, there it was, a gift from God. In this sanctuary this morning, many of us are experiencing times of transition. It is not unusual in this life to be in this place. Are you in an in-between time? If you are, you know it. Are you moving from what was to what will be? When you think about this life we live in, we are growing and changing and learning every single day, and so a part of us is in this process every day of our lives. 
but whatever in-between time you may be in, it could have to do with moving, where you live. It could have to do with primary relationships. It could have to do with the work that you do. It could have to do with your health or the health of someone you love. You're in this unknowing, uncertain time. And in the midst of this, I would ask you, what is God offering you? What is God offering you? Author Neil Donald Walsh writes, Yearning for a new way will not produce it. Only ending the old way can do that. You cannot hold on to the old all the while declaring that you want something new. The old will defy the new. The old will deny the new. The old will decry the new. There is only one way to bring in the new. You must make room for it. There is only one way to bring in the new. You must make room for it. How do we do this? How do we do this in the midst of transition? Well, I think one of the first things we have to do is believe wholly and fully that God is in all things and all places. We say this, we say we believe it, but when we're in crisis, when we're in a time in between, sometimes it's hard to believe it. We need to remember that God is not restricted by our struggle to recognize God in the unfamiliar. The fact that we are in a time in between, experiencing longing, discomfort, or pain, is in no way, in no way indicative of God's absence. We know that God was with us in the past because we can look back and we can see it, and we're sure that God will be with us in the future, but somehow, in the midst of pain and suffering, God seems absent in our inability to find home. That's not true. Our discomfort and pain does not equal God's absence. When we're moving from what has been to what will be, we can have some pretty definite ideas of what the future should look like. When we're in the midst of transition, what God is trying to give us, sometimes our very future is right in front of us and we can't recognize it. We cannot recognize it yet. After six weeks, in the assisted living facility, great aunt Eleanor was a believer. She loved it there. Good things happened in those six weeks. She was having physical therapy, so she was feeling stronger again. She was meeting people and having interactions with folks. During the time, those six weeks that she was in physical therapy, the administrator would call on a regular basis and update my folks on how she was doing, and at one point, She said to my dad, you know, for a wisp of a woman, your aunt eats like a (laughs) farmhand. She was able to play cards again. She'd forgotten how much she loved to play cards. She'd lived alone for so long. She had told my parents when they went to see her, one of the best things about this place is there's always somebody to play cards with. When they did finally go see her, and she had let them know that she was ready to let go of her house, And so there was a lot of work to be done with that. They went to go see her at the assisted living facility, and she knew that they were coming. She was waiting for them in the foyer. She was using a walker, and actually she was convinced she didn't need it, but they made her use it for balance. She was in her best pink suit. Her hair was done. Her nails were done at the beauty shop right there on site, and I'm sure she told them exactly how to do it. And she felt the need to give my folks a tour of the whole place as if they had never been there before. Are you in a time in between? Do you know what? Probably the majority of us are in some aspect of our lives. Do you know what God is offering you in this time? Something unexpected? Something unfamiliar? Something new? What is this? Maybe just exactly what you need. Thanks be to God. Amen.